stretch and build up and refresh, Lord God. We invite you here in this place tonight, Lord. We praise you and worship you, God, in Jesus' name. Now I know 
Lord, till we breathe our last breath, Father, that, God, we would follow you, we would worship you and praise you all the days of our lives, Lord, until our very last breath, till the very end, God, that, Father, we would hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Holy fire. My desire for anything that is not of you, but is of me, I want more of you and less of me, amen. fire burn away my desire for anything that is not of you but is of me I want more of you and less of me time holy fire holy 
holy fire burn away my desire for anything that is not of you but is of me I want more of you and less of me
shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me Snowwall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Snowball you won't kick down, line you won't tear down, coming after me. Only overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. for that love that never gave up on us and never will give up on us, Lord. And Lord, we run to you. Forgive us, God. Forgive us when we look to self. Forgive us when we go astray. Forgive us when we blow it. Forgive us, God. Thank you, Father, that you are our high priest that sympathizes with our weaknesses, as your word says who is in all points tempted, yet without sin. And so, Lord, we come tonight, Lord, just uh, with ears open, hearts ready to receive what you want to say. And we ask you, Father, to just speak to us. We ask you to minister to us. We ask you that you would just uh, do what you do. <laughs> Change and strengthen and transform lives making us more like you, God. Stripping away at our flesh, Lord God, and drawing us near to you in the spirit. We praise you and we love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Why don't you guys turn around and say hi to somebody while I unplug and get all set here.
I can do it if you want. Unless you want to open it. I got three. Good evening, church. Let's get right. Let's get right into these announcements. So, Pastor Jeff, it's already, it's already here. This Saturday, if you if you're planning to attend that memorial, it's going to take place at 11 a.m. So, show up two hours in advance because it will be a packed house. Also, we're going to have communion this Sunday. How exciting! We had. The resurrection, now the communion. What a what a good compliment to that. And then last but not least, we got the Signal app. That's going to take place tomorrow night at 8.30. If you guys haven't joined, I encourage you guys to join. Get prayed up or pray for someone because we're all in need of that. And I think that's it for the announcements. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you. We thank you, Lord, for this Wednesday service, Lord. I can so relate to the song, Lord, left the 99 to go after that one, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. I'm that one. And I just thank you, Lord, for this church, for what you're doing in this church. And um, I just ask you, Lord, for your presence for tonight. Touch Pastor Fish and uh, just give us a good message in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Yes. Well. Open your Bibles to 1 Kings 14. We're going to jump right back into 1 Kings. Loving this book. Loving it, loving it, loving it. Um, just um, getting so much out of it and being so encouraged and even just challenged by the word. We've been... Um, We've been out of First Kings for, for a little bit. I think we just missed one week. We, I did uh, the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross last Wednesday as we looked at um, just, man, powerful sermon that he gave on the cross. And tonight we're going to just jump right back into First Kings chapter 14 and the title of this Bible study, you ready? The Devastating Effects of Sin. You all ready? <laughs> the devastating effects of sin. I want to review with you really quick in order to develop a, a context for you tonight. After King David's death, David, as you guys know, he was the uh, second king in Israel. Saul was the first. Saul was the worst. David was the first good king. He had, was a man after God's own heart, was by far not a perfect man. And we studied the life of David. But... Um, David had some really, really great, amazing uh, attributes in his life, but yet he was a man. And in, in his manhood, he fell and he messed up with Bathsheba and through his, that, and then committing murder and killing uh, her husband Uriah. And then after that, just now having uh, married her, they have a son, Solomon. Solomon, he takes the throne and Solomon started off great, just like his dad, but finished horrible, horrible. Went off and married uh, uh, <laughs> 700 wives, 300 concubines. Solomon, what were you smoking, my friend? You were on something, all right? 700 wives, 300 concubines, and through that, Solomon went in, and most of these women were from foreign lands. They were worship pagan gods, and Solomon would build altars and shrines to these gods so these women can worship their god. And he was the king of Israel. He was a representative of God to the people. And Solomon was doing all this. And then Solomon begins worshiping these other kings, or these gods, I should say little gods. And it just is a really good picture, by the way, that bad company corrupts. Bad company corrupts. You surround yourself with bad company, it will corrupt you. Uh, it, it's, it's one thing to, you know, have a lot, you know, I have non-believer friends, you know, um, but I'm not, you know, and I'll hang out with them to win them to Christ. That's my goal. 
I cannot hang out with them if my goal is not to win them to Christ. Why? Because if I do, they will have more of an influence on me than I will on them. And so my mindset is to win them to Christ. If I'm going to make that allowance in my life, then I must make it a goal in my life to point them to Jesus. Because if not, they're going to have an influence on me. And so Solomon was influenced by these pagan women, a thousand of them. He goes on and he dies. And in the process, he has a son, Rehoboam, from one of the women that we're going to look at tonight. And um, Rehoboam is, you know, the king of the northern kingdom. And the kingdom is split into two. There's this ugly division that happens. The northern kingdom is called Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah. And Jeroboam ruled the southern kingdom, while the northern kingdom was ruled, um, I mean, Rehoboam, I should say. Uh, Solomon's son was Rehoboam, not Jeroboam. Uh, Rehoboam ruled the southern kingdom, while the northern kingdom was ruled by another man named Jeroboam. And after the kingdom split, um, Jeroboam worried that uh, when the annual feast would come, that the people would go and they would worship at the temple there in Jerusalem, and then their hearts would be touched by the Lord. Just like I heard just a few minutes ago that the last song we did, man, it just, that ain't home. That was our song. You know, and the Lord just spoke, and the Lord just touched. And, 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 and so Jeroboam's fear was that the people would go and they would worship in Jerusalem, and then they would begin having second thoughts. And when they had second thoughts, then they would begin following after God, and Jeroboam would feel like the people would uh, leave him, and he would lose his kingdom. So what does he do? He decides to start a new religion, a new religion and set up a place of worship at Bethel and Dan and complete with a golden calf and it just gets crazy again, and that's where we left off, and the result was the people are in a bad place with the Lord. And listen, this was all the result of Solomon's sin, of marrying pagan women, and then getting caught up in their worship and accommodating them in their worship, making compromises in his life and begin worshiping all these other pagan gods, building shrines for them and altars for them. And that horrific sin, you guys, was, the, uh, uh, was now filtered down to the rest of the people and the rest of the kings that would follow him. They would follow them as well. They would now begin to get into it. It's just an ugly, ugly thing. And tonight we'll begin to see the consequences begin to unfold in the life of Jeroboam and in the people of the northern kingdom that he ruled. And so 1 Kings chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. At that time, Jeroboam's son Abijah became very sick. And so Jeroboam told his wife, disguise yourself so that no one will recognize you as my wife. Then go to the prophet Ahiah at Shiloh, the man who told me I would become king. Take him a gift of 10 loaves of bread, some cakes and a jar of honey, and ask him what will happen to the boy. That's like, bring him some Krispy Kreme. You know, he's gonna, <laughs> take him some Krispy Kreme, take him some, I don't know, whatever, just... Give them all these goodies. Café de olla. Take them café de olla. All right. Take them all these things. But here's something very interesting. Th this wicked king, Jeroboam, had been warned by God through a prophet in chapter 13 that there was going to be consequences for his sin. But the sad part is that he didn't listen. He didn't listen. Even after his hand in chapter 13 was paralyzed, he would cry out to uh, 
uh, a prophet to pray to God so that God would touch him and heal him. Sadly, chapter 13 in verses 33 and 34 says, but even after this, listen, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil ways. He continued to choose priests from the common people. He appointed anyone who wanted to become a priest for the pagan shrines. And this became a great sin and resulted in the utter destruction of Jeroboam's dynasty from the face of the earth. Wow. That's how the end of chapter 13 ends. He was stiff necked. The Bible, the Bible uses a term stiff necked. I like that. I like that term. We, our term today is stubborn. But, but, the, but the term means stiff neck. It's so funny. My beautiful Lola at home. My bear, when, 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 I, when I tell her it's time to go into the crate, Lola listens. But you ought to see my wife. You ought to see how Lola gets with her. And Lola gets stiff neck. And, you know, Rhonda's grabbing her and pulling her by the collar. And Lola's like, and then she just lays down. And now Rhonda's dragging her across. And she's like, can you help me? And I get up and I go, Bear, come on, go. And she gets up and goes in the crate. But being stiff necked, you guys, and I picture now. I no longer want to use the word stubborn anymore because I picture stiff neck just makes it more clear. It's just, right? I'm not moving. You're not moving me. I'm stiff necked. And some people are very set in their ways and stiff necked. Amen or no amen? amen. Don't be that person. <laughs> Don't be that person. Don't be stiff necked. This guy, Jeroboam, was very stiff necked. He was set in his ways, and he did not listen, and he did not repent. And sadly, sadly, in verse 1 of chapter 14, the first person to be affected by Jeroboam's stiff neckness, that's a word, by his sin would be his own son, Abijah getting very sick. Now, I would imagine getting very sick in the ancient world would not be a good thing for obvious reasons. That they didn't have the modern medicine and the modern equipment that we have today. So if you got very sick, it was more than likely a death sentence for you. And so his son would get very sick. But what does he do? He didn't do what you would imagine. He, he didn't do what you would think a parent should do. Abijah, by the name, his, by the way, his name means, listen, Yahweh is my father. That's what his son's name means. Yahweh is my father, but his father does something complete opposite. He did not tell his wife to pray to God for their son or to ask a prophet to pray to God for their son. Instead, Let's read it again. He says, disguise yourself so that no one will recognize you as my wife and go to the prophet Ahiah at Shiloh, the man who told me I would become king. Take him a gift. Bring him some Krispy Kremes. Do these things. He looks to a man and seeks to use that man, a prophet, as a fortune teller type thing rather than seeking the Lord. Let me butter him up by bringing him some cakes. Let me butter him up by doing this. Let me disguise my wife. Let me just be deceitful and just go to this man. And let's use him like a fortune teller type thing. And once again, here is a great picture of someone turning to others instead of turning to the Lord. Don't get me wrong. I believe the Lord uses people in our lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen it, I've experienced it. But what happens is, is we can fall into the very easy trap of looking to others first rather than looking to the Lord. And what really needs to happen is that 
when you're, you're in a situation and when you're seeking out counsel, it's wise to seek counsel from godly people that you trust and you're willing to open up to. But listen, that counsel should confirm that which the Lord has already been speaking to you. It's, it's not something that you should be seeking first and then going to the Lord. It should be something that you've already been seeking the Lord and then you go and seek the counsel because the Lord has placed them on your heart to go and seek that counsel. And now what they say simply just confirms what God has already been speaking to you. Let the Lord be the Lord in your life. Amen. Amen. But on another note, it's his son that got sick. And this ministers to me in my life as a parent regarding my kids. And you parents too. Seek the Lord on their behalf. Seek the Lord on the behalf of your kids. Pray for your kids. Pray for their futures. Pray for their future spouses. Pray for their health. Pray for a spiritual covering over them, especially in this world where all these influences through social media and just all this garbage is just coming at them. Pray for a covering over them. Pray for the prodigals to come home. Seek the Lord first. Don't look elsewhere. I like what Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says. We all know it. Be anxious about nothing. <laughs> but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. That's a very interesting little addition to that verse there. In every trial and every difficulty, we're to be thankful. What? God, I ain't thankful for this. This is the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life. You should be thankful because the Lord is strengthening you. He's teaching you. And God is working in your life. There is a series of things that perhaps have happened in your life. Have you considered the Lord? Have you considered that the Lord closes one door and opens up another? Have you considered the Lord moving people and things in your life to bring in new people and things in your life? Have you considered that? Have you considered that God is on the throne? <laughs> His heart is for you. It's not a against you. He is for you. It's a beautiful thing to know that. And so with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then he says that in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I like this verse, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11. Write this one down. This is a doozy. I like this. He says, seek the Lord and his strength Seek his presence continually. Continually. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Do that for yourself. Do that for your children. Seek the Lord continually. Another quick thing that I want to point out of just these first three verses is that Jeroboam's son was sick. Very sick. Even though Jeroboam was a king. Jeroboam had it all. That didn't exempt him from troubles that the common people faced. Rich people, famous people, face all the same kinds of trials that we do. They just happen to be famous and they just happen to have more money. But that does not exempt them from trials and tribulations. They do get sick. I mean, the Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, just diagnosed with cancer. 
She's got more money than you can ever imagine. She's got cancer. Jeroboam's son is sick. And his sickness worried him and caused him to seek uh, help from a prophet. And look at verse 4. And so Jeroboam's wife went to Ahiah's home at Shiloh. And he was an old man now and could no longer see. This man, Ahiah, was an old guy who could no longer see. He was blind, but he was a prophet who could speak to the people on behalf of God. And even though he was blind, his eyes were closed, but his ears were open. His eyes were closed, but his ears were open. In other words, although he was blind physically, he was tuned in spiritually. And that is the key as a believer. It's always a great thing to be tuned in to the Lord spiritually. To be in close connection with headquarters. <laughs> to know God's heart. To be seeking God's heart. To be getting God's mind in every situation. In every circumstance in your life. Rather than looking around and seeing all the difficult things and the overwhelming things in your life, you're looking to the Lord and seeking Him continually, seeking His strength and His presence continually, right? First Chronicles 16, 11. We're doing that continually. And as we're doing that, man, we, we might be blinded by different things going on. We may not fully understand the, everything that's happening, but our hearts and our minds are tuned into the Lord spiritually. And you may even have all kinds of physical ailments. You might have all kinds of physical ailments and not able to do much physically. But you can still be tuned in to the Lord. And you will be far healthier than most people. <laughs> because you are connected. My wife, it's crazy the discernment that God gives her. Do you guys remember Nextel? Is Nextel still around? right and it's a chirp right and you it's like my it's like my wife has a next tell with god and god tells her god gives her crazy discernment about things people situations it's amazing she's tuned in so stay tuned in or get tuned in and that's this guy Ahia, he's tuned in. Verse 5, but the Lord told Ahia, Jeroboam's wife, uh, will come here, pretending to be someone else, and she will ask you about her son, for he is very sick. L look at, the Lord is speaking to this guy, and the Lord is telling this guy that Jeroboam's wife is going to come. She's going to lie. She's going to be fake. Get ready. Give her the answer I give you. So when Ahia heard her footsteps at the door, he called out, come on in, wife of Jeroboam. Why are you pretending to be someone else? <laughs> I like that. I like that. That, 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 that. I love that when she, when, when she came in acting fake, he called her out right away. He just called her out right away. I'm not going to allow you to be fake around me. I'm just going to say it like it is. He just called her out. Then he told her, I have bad news for you. Dun, dun, dun. Right? That's not the beginning of a good conversation. I don't like it when people tell me, you want to hear the good news first or you want to hear the bad news? What is it do you want to hear? Just give me the bad news first and then, you know, make me feel better with the good news, right? <laughs> I don't know. But um, verse 7, give your husband Jeroboam this message from the Lord, the God of Israel. I promoted you from the ranks of the common people and made you ruler over my people Israel. I ripped the kingdom away from the family of David and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David, who obeyed my commands and followed me with all his heart and always did whatever I wanted. You have done more evil than all who lives before you. You have made other gods for yourself and have made me furious with your gold calves. And since you have turned your back on me, I will bring disaster on your dynasty and will destroy every one of your male descendants, slave and free alike, anywhere in Israel. Woo! Yikes! 
This is not a great description of him, <laughs> especially when it's a word from the Lord. Next is the consequences of all the sin and the rebellion in Jeroboam's, Jeroboam's life. And listen, before I go any further, there will always be consequences for sin. Always. You, you can be forgiven. You can be forgiven by God, but that doesn't mean that you, you, you're going to avoid the consequence of sin. There's always consequences. And as we get into verse 10 to 16, you're going to hear the consequence of what God says. Look at what it says, verse 10. Again, I will bring disaster on your dynasty and will destroy every one of your male servants, slave and free alike, anywhere in Israel. I will burn up your royal dynasty as one burns up trash until it is all gone. The members of Jeroboam's family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs, and those who die in the field will be eaten by vultures. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then Ahiah said to Jeroboam's wife, Go on home, and when you enter the city, the child will die. All Israel will mourn for him and bury him, and he's the only member of your family who will have a proper burial, for the child is the only good thing that the Lord, the God of Israel, sees the entire family of Jeroboam. In addition, the Lord will raise up a king over Israel who will destroy the family of Jeroboam. And this will happen today, even now. Then the Lord will shake Israel like a reed whipped out of the stream. And he will uproot the people of Israel from the good land that he gave their ancestors and will scatter them beyond the Euphrates River. For they have angered the Lord with the astral poles they have set up for worship. And he will abandon Israel because Jeroboam sinned and made Israel sin along with him. Wow. Devastating effects of sin. That, listen, two times in these verses, God says, I will. And then he adds, I, the Lord, have spoken. So it's very clear that you know God was not playing around. God had had it with Jeroboam. God had had it with his sin. He had it with all of his idol worship. He had it with the people getting into idol worshiping and, and all this other stuff. He was sick of it. He was done. And now Jeroboam's family and himself and the nation were all going to suffer because of his sin and what he created. And as soon as his wife came home and walked in the house, sadly, his son would die. Heavy. I've said this before, guys. It's, it's, it would be nice if we could sin in a bubble. But we can't. Our sin affects everyone. It affects your wives. It affects your kids. Your kids hear everything. They see everything. They're not dumb. Our kids are not dumb. They see and they know more than you realize. Be sure that you know your sin will find you out. It will be exposed. But God have mercy on us, man. We need to repent and turn from stuff. Before it starts affecting everybody around you. Stop being stiff-necked. Stop being stubborn. Stop being like Jeroboam's wife. Fake. Because I, I, hey, if I see it, trust me, I'll call you out. Not because I love you enough. I tell you. You got a booger in your nose? I tell you. I'm not going to let you walk around with a booger in your nose. I'll tell you. I love you enough to tell you that. Your breast stinks? I'll tell you. <laughs> We've got some sin in your life. I'll tell you because I love you, not because I'm judging you. And you have to be willing to do something about it. And trust me, like, when the Lord begins to bring that out in your life, man, you got you to gotta, you gotta do something about it, man. You can no longer hide it. If you're hiding it now, don't. Bring it out in the light. Deal with it now before it deals with you.
And so here we see that sin destroyed a legacy and hope of all promise. Jeroboam's sin would devastate his family. His son would not recover from sickness. He would die as soon as mom walked in the house. And I would imagine her hearing this word, especially when, 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 when Ahia says that I, the Lord, have spoken. I, I would imagine that that was the slowest walk she took home. Her only comfort would be that her son's death would be different from the rest of the family. He would be mourned for her. And he, he would get a proper burial. And the rest of the family and the rest of the dynasty, they, they didn't get that. So the application for us tonight would be that sin causes pain to those who are closest to us. Jeroboam's sin would damage not only his family, but would damage his nation. But on the right side, though, the end of Jeroboam's dynasty would not be the end of Israel as a nation. We obviously know that today. Israel is still a nation, a beautiful nation. And God would raise up a new king. But Jeroboam's sin introduced us to two certainties in the history of this nation, Israel. Number one, instability, and number two, exile. The history of the northern kingdoms is that there is uh, instability that would be a permanent characteristic of the northern kingdoms. There would be 19 different kings that would reign in 210 years of the history of the northern kingdom. 19 different kings. No stability. And none of them, by the way, would be good kings. They would all be bad. Every single one of them, horrible kings, ungodly, wicked kings. As a matter of fact, the reign of each of those kings would be marked by assassinations and overthrows, and the nation would eventually go into exile in 72, 722 B.C. I say all that to tell you is that sin can have a far greater impact than we have, could have ever imagined in our lives. So be careful. Be careful. Verse 17, so Jeroboam's wife returned to Tizah, Tizar, whatever. And the child died just as she walked through the door of her home. And all Israel buried him and mourned for him as the Lord had promised through the prophet Ahiah. And the rest of the events in Jeroboam's reign, including all his wars and how he ruled, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. And uh, uh, Jeroboam reigned in Israel 22 years when Jeroboam died. His son Nadab became the next king. The, the, the history, as it says here in the New Living, the, the book of the history of the kings of Israel, your Bible might say the chronicles of the kings of Israel. It, it's not the book of first and second, or the books of first and second chronicles, by the way, just so you know. It, it, they're not recorded in there. That's the history of the southern kings of Israel which most of them were, were, were good kings. This book records the history of the northern kings, which were all bad. And it's pretty safe to say that when God says he's going to do something, he does it. God said he was going to deal with this guy. God said he was going to wipe out all of his dynasty. God said he was going to you know, deal with the nation. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. God was faithful to do exactly what he did. And that could be a very scary thing if you're a person like Jeroboam. If you're stiff-necked like Jeroboam. If you know you need to repent like Jeroboam and you don't, you will suffer the consequences of your sin like Jeroboam did. It's just that simple. That can be a very scary thing because when God says a word and he keeps his word, and you're living in sin, that's not good. That's not good. But it can also be a very encouraging thing to you as well. 
Perhaps you might be waiting on the Lord to fulfill a promise to you. He spoke to you a promise. He spoke to you some words of encouragement. He said he's going to do something in your life, and you've been waiting. Lord, when? When? He's faithful. He said he's going to do it. He's going to do it. Listen, Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Everything will come and go, but God's word will stand. Time will come and go, but God's word will remain. When God gives a word to you, he's going to keep it. It might be a dark season for you right now. It might be a difficult time for you right now. But rest in the Lord. Trust him. He's faithful. Lean on his promises. Lean on his promises. Never go back. Look at his track record in your life. When has he ever failed you? Never. Never. He's always been faithful. He's never not been faithful to you. Listen, everybody look here. God is not like us. <laughs> we can be very unfaithful. We can be very selfish people. God is not like us. Amen? Thank God for that. He's not like us. God is faithful to his word. Even when you're unfaithful, God remains faithful still. Now the story shifts back from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom. Goes to Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Look at verse 21. Meanwhile, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was king in Judah, and he was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. And the city of the Lord, uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, the city the Lord had chosen from among all the tribes of Israel as a place to honor his name. Rehoboam's mother was Nama, an Ammonite woman. She wasn't a Hebrew woman. She wasn't an Israelite. She was an Ammonite. She was from uh, uh, Ammon, a perpetual enemy of Israel. And this was Rehoboam's mom, Solomon's wife, one of them. It was the product of this woman that, to be quite honest, Solomon should have never married. And remember, Solomon married all kinds of pagan women, and Amma was this Ammonite woman. And in verse 22, it says, during Rehoboam's reign, the people of Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking his anger with their sin, for it was even worse than that of their ancestors. For they also built for themselves pagan shrines and set up sacred pillars and asteroid poles and every kind of hill and under every green tree. There was even male and female shrine prostitutes throughout the land, and the people imitated the detestable practices of the pagan nations uh, the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign, King Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem, and he ransacked the treasuries of the Lord's temple and the royal palace, and he stole everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. King Rehoboam later replaced them with bronze shields and substitutes, and he entrusted them to the care of the commanders of the guard who protected the entrance to the royal palace. And whenever the king went to the temple of the Lord, the guards would also take the shields and then return them to the guard room. Complete chaos happening under the reign of Rehoboam. Worship of pagan gods. Homosexuality was running rampant. It says there in verse um, 24, there were even male and female shrine prostitutes. Your Bible might say that there were sodomites. Sodomites. 
all kinds of sodomites in the land, is how the King James uh, reads it. It was very clear that God had never approved and never will approve of that kind of lifestyle. It's, it's biblical. And listen, family, it's not hate speech. This is just a lifestyle of sin that the Lord does not accept and one in which he sent his son to die for. You guys, it's sin. It's what the Bible calls sin. It's one of many sins. Just as fornication is a sin. Sleeping around with somebody that's not your spouse, so is homosexuality. So is being a drunk. So is being a, 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 a murderer, a thief. It's a lifestyle that God never approves of. It's one that sent his son Jesus to the cross. And God said it's evil right here. And God said he had enough. And, and if it bothers you, your argument is not with me. It's with the Lord. It's with his word. There is a Bible right now that you can purchase. It's known as, you ready, you ready for this? The Queen James Bible. It's known as the Queen James Bible. And it's removed all of the scriptures that God condemns regarding homosexuality. Listen, you guys, you can't change the Bible to fit your lifestyle. Your lifestyle is to change to fit God's. You're a new creation in Christ. If you're a believer, you ought to live that way. Not trying to find ways to be what your old person was before Jesus. You can't put new things into law and then think that God will approve of it. I mean, we just saw that this week on Good Friday. Our wonderful president, and I say that jokingly, Joe Biden declared Easter, March 31st, International Transgender Day of Visibility. It's to be observed every March 31st. Easter is observed on the first Sunday after the first full moon or on after the spring equinox. And this year, for the second time since Transgender Day of Visibility was established 15 years ago, and the last time will be in 2086, the two happened to coincide, and President Biden publicly honored both of them. He has done every year, he's honored the Transgender Day of Visibility every year since he took office in 2021. And President Biden released a proclamation on Friday to honor the extraordinary courage and contributions of transgender Americans and reaffirm our nation's commitment to forming a more perfect union where all people are created equal and treated equally throughout their lives. And then on Sunday, the president said that Easter reminds us of the power of hope and the promise of Christ's resurrection. Which one do you want, Joe? <laughs> Which one do you want? You can't serve two masters, Jesus said. You either love one or you hate the other. You can't serve God and you can't serve man. You can't seek to please God and seek to please man. You have to stand. You have to draw a line. You have to make a standard. Our country is in bad shape, morally. Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Graham, said this. She said, if, if God doesn't judge the United States of America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That ain't going to happen.
Our president and many others like him need to repent. We need to repent. And in November, Joe's got to go. In Jesus' name, Joe's got to go. Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8, says this. Joyful are the people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. Listen, they do not compromise with evil. They walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn to lean, or as I learn your uh, righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. Love that. Psalm 119, 1 through 8 in the New Living. I like that he adds, please don't give up on me. You know what that tells me about the psalmist? He was a knucklehead, just like you and I. He's, he's saying, God, teach me. Teach me to walk your, and to live your righteous regulations. I will thank you by living as I should. And when I compare my life to your word, when I compare my life to your regulations, I won't be ashamed. I won't be embarrassed. But until I get to that point, Lord, because I know I'm a work in progress, please don't give up on me. You guys? Joy for other people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Don't do your own thing. There are devastating effects of sin, devastating effects of doing your own thing. You will pay for it personally, and sadly, the ones that you love the most will pay for it secondly. They're the, they're the collateral damage, and it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. So God teaches us to keep our eyes and our hearts fixed on you, amen? amen? And avoid these devastating effects of sin. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for this time. And Lord, um, I don't know. I don't know who needed to hear this message. I don't know where people stand really with you. You do. And God, I just ask, Father, that, um, that Lord, you would um, really just cause us to be people that are, one, not stiff-necked, two, not fake, three, not dumb, that, God, we would take these warnings, the stern warnings, Lord God. And, God, we wouldn't ignore them. That, Lord, we would repent if we need to repent. We would surrender if we need to surrender. We would not disguise anything, Lord God. But, God, we'd be open and come to you. He who covers his sin shall not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes it will find mercy. God, help us, Lord, to be those types of people who would say tonight, Pastor Fish, pray for me. Pray for me. I'm fighting. I'm battling. Actually, I just need to recommit, Lord. I need to give you my heart, God. If that's, if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to say it. I want you to mean it with your heart and just, man, just clear up that junk from your life. Confess it to the Lord. No longer walk around with that. Don't be fake anymore. Don't be foolish either. Don't ignore these warnings. Don't hide it. Don't think it's just going to go away. Deal with it now before it deals with you. 
Say, God, forgive me. Forgive me of my sin, God. I surrender this garbage to you, God. My heart. And God, I ask, God, that you would just help me to turn it all over to you. To not be stiff-necked anymore. But to surrender everything completely to you, God. Surrender my will and my ways, and I ask you to be my God and my Lord, and lead me and direct me in the way everlasting, God. Teach me your righteous regulations, and help me not to be ashamed when I compare my life to them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Any questions regarding anything? Any comments? Love to answer anything. Um, trust me, just because you ask a question, nobody don't think you're in sin. <laughs> Noah, yes. Sodomites, that's what a sodomite is. Is I could be I guess it's a misunderstanding. Does the Bible classify it as one or is it still as near that or is it separate as prostitution is a separate thing or is it still not so bad? Do you get what I mean? Yes, so prostitution is prostitution. A homosexual homosexual sodomy. Male sodomites, that's the other um, definition of it. So, um, yeah, look, you look at the translations and, and, and they say different things, but it's referring to sodomy and um, temple prostitutes as well, whether they're male and female. But it's craziness going on there. Imagine, just imagine for a moment. You come to real life Calvary Chapel and there's temple prostitutes here. How demonic is that? And people come, they come to church, and there's a temple prostitute there. It, 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 that's crazy. That is crazy. So, yeah. Anything else? Yes. So when we read the Jeroboam dynasty died, right? Mm -hmm. And then Nadab becomes king. Yes. I thought this dynasty died. Good question. I like that. So Nadab and Abihu, right? They were wicked dudes. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same Nadab that it talks about, um, um, but the dynasty ending, um, obviously, it, it, it would continue on for a period of time, and then eventually everybody would just die off, and the dynasty would end. So, um, but that's a good question. I don't think everybody just died right there, right? Just dropped dead, and the whole dynasty's over. I mean, people will continue on, but the dynasty eventually will die and will no longer be. And so that's, that's, that's that. Thought you had me though. <laughs> good one. No, that's a good question. Anybody else? Good. I like them. I, I like these questions. They sharpen me. They help me. And if I don't have an answer, I just say I'll come back to you next week. Give you an answer next week. That's always a good thing. So, love you guys. See you tomorrow night on Signal. If you don't have the app, get it. When you get it, get on it. Eight thirty. We're going to pray. It's going to be a good time, okay? God bless.